As might be expected, totalitarianism curtailed the development of European theater and drama. This is not to suggest, however, that theatrical activity ceased under totalitarianism. In the totalitarian societies, particularly the Soviet Union under Stalin and Germany under Hitler, there were government-supported theaters, used as instruments of propaganda. There were also some daring theater artists who attempted to attack these regimes, though for the most part expression and experimentation were suppressed. The Soviet government immediately recognized the value of theater's propaganda. After the revolution, mass spectacles, usually elaborate outdoor events with casts made up partly of amateurs, were organized. In the 1930s, the Soviet Union established socialist realism as the only acceptable theatrical form. Plays were to be written in realistic style and were to convey a clear socialist message. In Nazi Germany, analogous theatrical forms were supported and numerous melodramas exalting Nazism were staged. Early in Hitler's regime, mass spectacles called Things Spielen were presented. One example of this form was Richard Ehringer's Deutsch Passion 1933, which presented Hitler as a Christ figure, wearing a crown of thorns made of barbed wire, and gathering apostles and converts to save Germany from the evil Weimar Republic. After rescuing the fatherland, the Nazi dictators crucified and ascends to heaven amid organ music and a chorus of angels. Obviously, theater artists who opposed totalitarian regimes were suppressed. In Spain, as we've seen, the playwright Federico Garcia Lorca was killed by Franco's forces during the Spanish Civil War, and productions of Lorca's works, which dramatized the oppression of Spanish women, were prohibited. This ban remained in effect until Franco's death in 1975. In the Soviet Union, the works of playwrights considered politically dangerous were censored and not allowed to be staged. About 50 years after it was written, one of these dramas, Nikolai Erdman's The Suicide, 1928, which presents suicide as an act of political resistance, was produced in London, Chicago, and New York. We have already noted that director Meyerhold, who attempted unsuccessfully to stage The Suicide in 1929, was imprisoned and later executed for his opposition to socialist realism. Numerous German theater artists, because of their religion or their politics, were forced to flee Germany after Hitler came to power in 1933. They included the directors Max Reinhardt and Erwin Piskater, as well as the playwrights Bertolt Brecht and Ernst Toller. Many artists who opposed the Third Reich but did not leave were imprisoned in Nazi concentration camps. Nonetheless, some theater artists did resist the rise of totalitarianism. During the 1940s, for example, the exiled Bertolt Brecht wrote The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui, which characterized Hitler as a Chicago gangster. Theater as a form of resistance to totalitarianism and to the horrors of World War II is most vividly illustrated by the theatrical activities organized by inmates of the Nazi concentration camps. In the mid-1930s, the Nazi guards for their own amusement at Oranienburg and Dachau forced prisoners to stage productions. Surviving accounts reveal that these presentations satirized the camps, yet the artists were not punished. During the war, in the concentration camps in Nazi-occupied territories such as Auschwitz, there are surreptitious improvised entertainments in the barracks. These presentations consisted of literature and drama recited from memory, satirical skits, and traditional songs. In the camp at Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia, satirical plays, operas, and cabaret entertainments were written and staged. Such entertainments were possible there because the Nazis were using Theresienstadt as a model camp. They showed it to Red Cross officials and foreign visitors to discredit rumors of atrocities. Most of the artists at Theresienstadt were later sent to extermination centers. <laughs>